Welcome to CEO Money. I'm Michael Yorba. Thanks for joining with us. All right, I have Jorg Molt. He is Bitcoin co-founder and also, uh, I believe, the director of Satoshi School. Jorg, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. And yes, you said it. <laughs> All right. Now, Jorg, you are the co-founder of Bitcoin, and that goes to say a lot of things. Give us some background on yourself, and then I want to get into the Satoshi School. I have a lot of questions for you, but let's start with that. Okay, in an easy way, um, <clears throat> I was born in the 1972s, and I'm yeah, now 46 years old. And as you can imagine, I'm one of the guys having the first computers ever, the home computer, VC20, C64, and Amiga, with all the stuff started over, I would say. And from that point, you can imagine I'm from Europe. Not a lot of people could afford to buy this computer. And I was in a very little, small community. My father was a banker and he sends me all over the world to um, get knowledge about hardware, computer software, computer coding uh, in the former times. And <clears throat> yeah, he understands that this is my, um, I would say this is the thing for me to get on in the future because i said um i never will get a banker or something like that but he said computer will be and you out in the world what happens after that was that i become knowledge of a lot of groups who um were cracking the games you know um the commodore computer was um most sold computer in every time in history because of all the games and the free availability through cracking and hacking. But you learn a lot about computer technology if you're going from the hacking side. So what happens uh, was in the mid nineties when um, a guy from my former, uh, my former friends come to me and said, hey Jörg, what do you think about computer technology? Where will it go in the next years? And I was saying, okay, faster, more better graphics, games are not so easy to hack and more challenges in that and the coding. And he says that, right, but can you imagine that there is something about that um, computer can control the world in the future? And I was in the mood and was saying, ah, I don't believe. So he said, have you ever read George Orwell 1984, for example? And I said, never. So my parents um, listened to the speech and um, bought me that book. And um, I expected a new home computer at uh, Christmas time. So they gave me first the book and said, if you do not read that book, you wouldn't prepare for the future so we can't support you with new computer te technology. So I was saying, okay, a book uh, from the 1940s um, written by a guy I do not know, maybe a little bit dusty <laughs> and said, okay, I will read this book. And I clearly understand at that moment that someday the point will come where computer control everything in your life. And as we see as present, it is there. So what happens, I called the guy back and was saying to him, okay, what are you working in? And he said, okay, you can read code, you uh, hacked a lot of games, and we want you to show over some concepts about um, making digital files in a way um, secure that no one can access to them, even if they are on their own computers. So we have a file transfer, for transfer protocol, and it is very secure. And um, after a time, I um, figured out that I'm, that I'm working as a supporter to um, the DigiCash team. And they worked on all the stuff with David Shom. This was uh, later, uh, let's say one year later, I figured it out. And for me, it was not about the coding. I'm, I can code, I can read code, but there are a lot of guys who can do that in a much better, faster way than me. So um, I'm working, uh, I've worked as a conceptualist. Um, hacking is about the concept. It's not about that you can code. Um, you find as a conceptualist a door. You find an open door to come in. You find the keys, the right access code or everything, and uh, you manage how to find it. It's more about think about a car as a designer, I would say. And if you design uh, um, 
uh, say re-engineering or something like that in technology to find flaws in the code. This is much more that what I do. And so <clears throat> I was on a whiteboard in all these groups, think about the app Slack, how we work together for gay. Where with Slack, you can invite people only by email without knowing who is who and work together because if the project is not running and the guy is not working in your mood and in that what you want to reach with the whole team, you can kick him out easily without knowing him, you know. And in former times, we worked with all the whiteboard stuff with emails and everything. And that leads me into this group. So from that point, when it split up because David Schaum was going to the banks, to the Deutsche Bank and presented his system and his card system and all the stuff about, um, uh, it was clear for me and uh, a lot of people from the team to leave that path and work on different projects. So what happens was we work on a lot of um, uh, other money uh, programs like Mcash, Zcash. You have seen um, Nick Sabo with um, Bitgold and everything. But as long as I had a concept to hack all those things, as long we can't provide it to the crowd. So um, think about, you say we have the new money, it's secure, we use computers to transfer money or digital um, files in a way no one has seen before. And it's secure, you can use it over a thousand computer in your private home without access. And the hacker is coming around five minutes later, like in Ethereum, the DAO. Um, then you have a strong impact to make. And um, for the first digital currency, of course, Bitcoin, it must unhackable. It must in a way that no one can crack in. And this is a necessary to get out with all this stuff. And I was, of course, of my knowledge of the people in the first row when it comes to um, Satoshi Nakamoto and uh, the talks about cryptocurrencies and the white paper from him, because there are keystones, uh, cornerstones in there from technology we uh, mixed up uh, in former times. Think about Bitcoin is more a file transfer protocol than a ledger, because um, <clears throat> It is uh, uh, comes from the Napster times and is a mix up with uh, BitTorrent clients, which are also file transfer protocols. Yes, uh, and you can send a PDF over the Bitcoin network if you want um, and if you uh, know how. So this is the difference from blockchain technology, for example. This is only a few shots I will give you here at the moment. But this is um, <clears throat> this is the magic when you are in from the very beginning. You have a lot of knowledge people forget about and um, have to learn and study in a hard way today. Let me ask you, um, one of your statements is that you that Bitcoin sooner or later must become uh, worth a million dollars. Why do you say that? Yeah, um, a lot of pin, uh, people do not understand what the power of limitation is. So for your example, you say gold is limited, OK, but you haven't got seen gold in a limitation. You can't feel it. In Bitcoins, we exactly know every 10 minutes Bitcoins coming out of the system and the total amount of Bitcoins is fixed by mathematics, not by belief. So if uh, in the future, like the past 10 years, no one can come into Bitcoin system, um, you can't change this amount. And um, the demand of Bitcoin is rising and not only from a point that you say, okay, the traders go in or something like that. Um, more from the people outside the US and Europe. Um, I would say in the third countries, like you see the news about Argentina, you have seen what happened to the stock market uh, this day again. So these people are very, um, um, uh, let's say they have a high demand on Bitcoins because of their uh, situation, where they live and how they treat by their governments and everything. And they need something they can believe in, which gives them a stabilized um, subsidiary for money. and. This belief leads us in a crowd from 2016 when we had um, about 2 million participations in the Bitcoin world, uh, world today to 50 million, like Coinbase was saying, each month since 2017, 50,000 new users uh, join Bitcoin and um, access to wallets and everything in there. So you see it is rising and the more people are in there on a limited system, um, the higher the price must be. And I suggest that we have in 2020, 2021, more than 150 million people in the Bitcoin space. I get it. All right. Um, why do you um, say that Bitcoin should not or is not an asset class? Um, this is given by definition. <clears throat> so Bitcoin is the first um, collateral um usage we have in the world so first you can send this bitcoin as a split all over the world i can even send you ten dollar in, in an asset all over the world but the people can 
traded and it is not um i would say the trading is not uh, depending on a third party so um, all assets in the world are depends on third parties so if government says you can't trade gold like happens in india your gold is worthless as a stable uh, item in a crisis so where will you sell your gold if it is not allowed what do you do with your um, diamonds for example and um, if we compare this all over the thing um, bitcoin is waterless and you can only just believe that this value is um, made for an exchange see i'm i'm born in germany and um, what if uh, happens after the uh, world war ii it was that the rice mark hasn't got any value anymore more and the people started to accept cigarettes as an exchange so um you can you bought everything by cigarettes and not by a rice mark so it is in the belief of the people to give the bitcoin the power as a necessary item and the shareable of the bitcoin all over the world we can cut it into eight digits behind the comma that means we can serve seven uh, seven billion people with only one satoshi and bitcoin is 100 million satoshis and one satoshi becomes one uh, one dollar one day we have uh, 2.8 quadrillion dollar at the moment we have all in all 2.4 quadrillion dollars and think about that thing it is an asset for people who wants to use it as an asset but two-thirds of all people are unbanked and if they use it for the daily spendings and do not exchange to the old fiat world you will likely see what the power of money is in bitcoin got it tell me about the satoshi school i want to know what you do there um, at the moment, we have a lot of problems out there because um, I would say this world is not in, in the right information about what it can do. To give you a good example, Satoshi School was founded um, first to give the people uh, more knowledge about how money works, how our fiat system works and why Bitcoin as a deflationary system can also bring danger to stable countries, but um, in countries with high inflation, what it can do for the society and um, bring the motor, the economy motor on again. On the other hand, we see the fintech, which is working with banks. And um, you heard about, for example, Libra coin, um, which is promoted by Facebook. They have a fractional banking in there about the tokens. They have created a really, really digital um, fiat money. So, but no one understands how it works and why that is, there's no advanced in that. So the school, should bring back the people the knowledge about. And when we talk about today about blockchain, um, <clears throat> I guess 99% of all the people and developer think they must bring something on the blockchain. At least blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology is not decentralized like Bitcoin, but um, it is necessary, for example, to do copyrights and something like that. That means doesn't mean that the item which is copyright uh, projected by a blockchain is on the blockchain. And, these are so many misunderstandings from, you have seen the ICOs, IEOs, a lot of investors lost a million of dollars in the past times. And um, bringing the people the knowledge, what is real and how they can um, understand how it is working and can make a decision by their own needs that they see all the sides of a medal, not only one side, which is shiny, but also have a feeling for that. As many old people say, yeah, I'm afraid about Bitcoin because fiat I can feel. So um, I teach them for having some Bitcoins, $10 on their wallet and watch the price up and down for three months. And then they got the feeling for that, not invest one million at once, you know. This is bringing the people a feeling for that, what happens here, because most of the people do not understand what happens. We hear promises of blockchain, but no one can see blockchain or can it feel it. We know everyone, every, every one knows what blockchain can do because we had all the conferences, but no one can see it and feel it. And bringing the people yeah, right on track, prepare them for the future. Um, now, in closing, I want to know uh, the top three myths that cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, have, have, are prevalent. What what can you do to, to dispel the top three myths in cryptocurrency and blockchain? Um, I would say first, <clears throat> um, a lot of people say, yeah, Bitcoin and blockchain technology is used for crime. Let's let's say for, for terrorism, financial and uh, money laundering. Mm -hmm. So the, the myth and the reality is that only one 
Ankündigungen um, on Blockchain Technology uh, and Money Laundering through Tokens and Bitcoins. Um, this is a reason why if you are a bad guy and you ever say you go and bomb a bank and now you have 100 millions on your pocket from the bank in cash, you can't call anyone to say, I want to turn it into Bitcoin. I will to change it into Bitcoin. Um, for another example, um, uh, when it comes to anti money laundering, um, a society which is um, free in their decisions by consensus, for example, is free to decide which um, taxes are necessary to keep the society up. We have a big flaw in that, that we pay taxes for the necessaries, but on top what we can't track. And um, a lot of people avoid taxes by um, the announcement that they say, if I can't track my money uh, at the government sites, but they want to know all about me, I'm not willing to pay taxes. And we have this um, situation in the US before Bitcoin, long before blockchain. Crimes, crime uh, is a necessary, uh, a blockchain or a Bitcoin can't have, hand out a weapon. So you have a suspicious, you have, uh, you have someone you um, watch and if he's doing wrong or his partner is doing wrong, you catch them. And uh, think about all the offshore accounts we have uh, since the 69, some Panama Papers came out to light now, but there are still a lot of left and new will be created. So there are more efficiency because they work on credit bar basis than a Bitcoin which hasn't got a credit line or something like that. So um, it will be used, but it is like you put a knife out of your um, drawer from the kitchen and you can decide cut the turkey or cut your wife, right? Right. And I believe in the good of the people. I believe that more people are um, will use their money to have a stable community, a safe neighborhood and everything in there. But they want to have the feeling that the money can't block by banks or anything and um there's the freedom needs rules of course that that's the thing yeah but i think um we are especially in the us um overprotected got it york thank you so much for being a guest on today's show i really appreciate you yeah get, getting up late and, thank you. and i would love to come visit you in the austrian mountains that sounds wonderful yeah of course have a nice day thank you for inviting me you're welcome. All right, you've been watching CEO Money with Michael Yorba. Thanks for joining with us. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.